Hi, this is Brad Scornavaco. I'm the head of school at Scornavaco Martial Arts Academy here in Longmont, Colorado. And what I'd like to share with you is a little list I put together called 30 Essential Questions You Must Ask Before You Join a Martial Arts School. And I put this list together originally for my sister-in-law who lives in Virginia. And she was looking for a martial arts school for her son. And because I didn't know the schools in Virginia because I don't live there, um, I just made a list for her, a quick bulleted checklist of things that she should look for so she could take it to the various schools and see what they had to offer and what their qualifications were. And I'd like to share that with you right now. I divided the questions up into three different categories. And the first one was um, the education and experience of the staff that would be teaching your child, which I think is the most important um, criteria you should be looking at uh, when, if you go anywhere. So anywhere you want your child, you want to make sure you have the best uh, staff and the best trained staff and to make sure that they know how to work with your child. So the first question is, do you have an education specialist on staff? And um, that's important because when you're dealing with children, you know, along with question two, which is do you have a child developmental specialist on staff, um, you want to make sure that you don't just have adults who are used to uh, just teaching adults or who don't even like children and are forced to teach them. Um, you want to make sure that they have some experience and background of best practices with, you know, how to teach children, how to deal with children who don't want to come to class or having challenges or, you know, just being kids. You want, you know, a firm but gentle disciplinary style is something that that is really important for kids. So uh, in my own experience, I have seen adults teach in the military and then try to teach civilians, which is really difficult in and of itself. And then you know, one step further, take their kind of martial arts training they learn in the military to, to children, and it doesn't work very well. They're very different skills, and a teacher needs to be able to teach all different ages, um, from children to young children, you know, four, five, and six-year-olds, all the way up to teenagers and to adults, and uh, they, they shouldn't all be taught together, and they shouldn't all be taught the same way. So it's really important that the teachers understand that difference and are ready to teach your child in an age-appropriate manner. The third question is you have a bullying uh, and a conflict resolution specialist. And that just doesn't come with a black belt. So somebody who just is a black belt doesn't necessarily understand how to de-escalate a confrontation, how children have to go to school every day, um, you know, need to handle kids who are being aggressive and bullying them. And um, so, so it's really important that they have some kind of experience outside of just punching and kicking on how to nonviolently deal with conflict. And if you want, I will send you a free copy of my book that I've written on bullying, which is called So I Won't Have to Fight, Bully Solutions for Martial Arts Masters. And there's a lot of good stuff in there that'll help you um, without ever having to go into a martial arts school. And again, that was something I did for family and friends, and I just publish the book and offer it for people um, in my town and pretty much anybody who wants a copy. So um, you can look at that. The fourth question kind of dovetails into the bullying situation, which is do you have uh, specialized knowledge and skill working with ADHD kids and other high needs children? And that's something that um, I have seen students come to my school from other schools that, that the instructors didn't even know what um, let's say Asperger's was or how to deal with ADHD kids other than to tell them that they have to focus. And ADHD is in particular something that is not just a matter of willpower. And there are certain practices and behaviors that can be taught to kids that will help them with that. So, um, you know, that's something that is really important. Again, you don't learn that just by, you know, learning how to block a punch. So these are, these are different skills other than the technical martial arts skills that should be any school you go into, the, the, the uh, staff should have those skills. I mean, that, that should be a given going into a martial arts school that they can do that. Um, and then number five is, are they CPR and, uh, CPR and first aid certified? And um, just to be clear, martial arts schools have a, a really low incidence of injury. And so, um, you know, but still you want to make sure that if something that were to happen in class, at least your child would be taken care of because it is a contact art and um, sometimes things do happen. So you want to make sure that you know safety first and that the instructors know that and are prepared for that because if they are certified um, in first aid, they have another understanding or a deeper level of understanding that um, how to take care of their class. 
So just the general um, kind of flow of the class will be such that you know they won't be doing things that are too dangerous. So um, that's really important. Number six, um, which is how long have you been training and teaching? It's a good question to ask the instructor. Um, and are you certified to teach? Have you been trained how to teach and not just you know do the martial arts? Again, because doing and teaching are two different skills. And at our school, I have, um, along with my wife, we have, who is a PhD in education, she's our education specialist, Dr. Carla, we go through um, best teaching practices and things that you should do, things that you shouldn't do with kids. So we're always um, working and training our staff on a weekly basis on how to do that. So, you know, how long somebody's been doing this is, is a very important question. You um, can see on this uh, little questionnaire I have for you, mine says 26 years. I did this about five, six years ago. So, you know, I personally am well over, you know, 30 plus years of, you know, nonstop teaching. So, you know, that makes a difference in, in because just the experience knows, the instructors will know um, how to deal with certain situations and um, again, with best practices. And um, that kind of brings me to, to question eight, which is, is continuing education required for the staff? Now, my martial arts instructor was a pilot. And you would think that when you know how to fly a plane, you're done. And even um, pilots have to keep going and getting uh, checked out and recertified and make sure that they're up to date on uh, you know the latest practices. So, you know, I think as any instructor, that's got to be something that um, students do. So, um, you know, all of my staff, myself, we um, continually are educating ourselves to make sure that um, we are prepared to be the best teachers possible. Um, educational backgrounds are important other than martial arts skill because it just kind of helps to see um, where the, their life experience comes from. And um, there are people I know who just, you know, they do martial arts because they don't have any other abilities. So they haven't had any education outside of just, you know, the sweating it out and, and learning the martial arts skills. And um, for example, my background, I my training is in philosophy and um, oddly enough economics, but um, that was really important was my <clears throat> training within my martial arts ability and my wife being um, a PhD in education. Those two things kind of mesh really well with being uh, instructors. Um, and I have been teaching since I was in fifth grade, uh, not just martial arts, other things. So, you know, the, the, again, the amount of time and experience is, is an important uh, factor, not to say that people who are new um, shouldn't be given a chance, but it's just something to look for. And number 10 is, has your entire staff gone through criminal background checks? Um, we have had a few people uh, at my own school come in and ask us that, and, and the answer is yes, because I have to. Um, I am a provider for uh, a charter school in town that deals with high-needs kids, and we all have to be background checked, uh, criminal background checked from them. And uh, I've had that myself, but then even an outside source has criminal background checked my staff. So um, again, it's just another layer of protection for you as a parent, and that's something you should do and ask for. Uh, we won't be offended, but wherever you take your, your child, you should know about that. Um, and being a martial arts school and a self-defense school, it's obviously something that we would um, want to foster. Um, is your staff trained to appropriately work with children? Um, that's another good question. Um, we have very stringent standards on, on how we touch children, where we touch children, and to make sure that there is uh, nothing um, inappropriate happening. So in my school, we have just one big room. So pretty much outside of you know somebody going to a changing room, everyone can see everything that's going on in my school, which is really important. So there's no hidden um, kind of rooms or anything. So we don't do private lessons without a parent present. And we always make sure that there's more than one adult in the school. And that's just, um, it's just precautions that we take. We set it up that way, the school. And as far as working with children, my staff, I train them all to make sure that um, they know, you know, touching the shoulders and the arms and, you know, from knees below and, and the head. And we stay away from the body. Even such things as tying belts, when we have to tie a child's belt, we do that so everyone can see where our hands are. And it's just um, something just to make sure that um, everybody understands um, our respect for our students. And um, that just leaves no question as to, as to anything um, inappropriate happening. Um, number 12 um, is just about extensive um, knowledge of, of safe body mechanics because in the martial arts, um, you know, there's a lot of movement, obviously, and instructors need to understand how the body works, how it doesn't work, 
and not have students do exercises that can actually hurt them while they're training um, because it's supposed to be self-defense, not self-destruction, and you don't want the actual training um, going against, um, you know, standard exercise physiology. Um, so, you know, that's something that's really important because there are outmoded martial art um, ideas and practices that, um, again, with the advent of sports science, um, you know, the really good schools have, have put that stuff aside to make sure that um, students are moving biomechanically correct. So it's really important, um, especially with, you know, so many more children doing sports and being involved that um, they need to make sure that their bodies are moving with proper form and proper posture and um, so they don't get hurt while they're training. And finally, 13 down here is, is there someone on staff who can answer questions? Help me. So um, can you get a hold of people at the school for what you need? And um, so the staff needs to be available. And um, for example, we have people on our phones from nine to nine and we also answer emails and text messages and um, anything we can do to help our students. So you wanna make sure that um, you know, you're treated, um, again, with respect from the staff that they will be there. So before class, after class, if you have to make appointments where you can come in and talk to somebody, you know, do those possibilities and um, opportunities to do that. So those are the first 13 questions and the, those cover pretty much the education experience and staff. The next category is curriculum and teaching. So this is all about what's going to happen, you know, when your child is out on the mat and, and how that is uh, structured for you so you can understand um, what your child is going to go through and needs to learn uh, to advance. So uh, number 14 is, is your disciplinary style positive and nurturing? And, you know, this is one that traditionally in martial arts it was very re regimented, military-like, where nobody laughed, nobody smiled, and it was just very much stone-faced. And, you know, children were kind of just taught like that. And it's not the best way, in our opinion, of how to teach children. So you want somebody who can have more of a nurturing style with the kids to inspire the children at the same time to make sure that um, the respect is, um, you know, given to the instructors and, and the students know um, how to behave in a class. So, you know, that's a fine line because it's easy for adults just to yell at children and make them, you know, be afraid uh, just so they listen. But that's that doesn't allow the children to internalize uh, the sense of discipline and, and how they should act. It's just more of them being afraid. And when you teach somebody out of fear, as soon as the person who is uh, making the child be afraid leaves, then the child will act differently. So that is not the best recipe for long-term success with a child. And um, number 15 is, is the t uh, student teacher ratio small enough. Um, so for example, in our school, we try to keep at least, you know, three adult instructors on the mat plus, you know, a couple younger assistant instructors to kind of help us. And, you know, I've had people come to my school and say that they're, you know, student was in a class of 30, 40 kids, there was one instructor, and I don't understand how a student could learn technical martial arts skills safely in groups that big with that few adults. That's just my opinion. And so I would always ask people to look for um, that teacher ratio. So it's not that the class itself has to be small, but there have to be enough adults who are watching the students. And it goes the same for adults. 16 is our class is age specific. And um, the reason that you want to look for age-specific classes is because I said earlier that you have to teach adults differently than you teach children of different ages. So if you looked at just the school system, are kindergartners with high school students and eighth grade students and middle school students, and you know that would be a disaster if you did that. And in a martial arts school, if you have you know somebody who's just come home from work and he jumps into a class with a six-year-old, you know that's not good for either one of them. Uh, because, again, they have different needs, and adults don't want to have to be stood up and sit down like children, and you can't have children attacking adults, for example, on the physical part. So in a self-defense-oriented school, it's very difficult to be, as an adult, training and practicing against a child. So it's better if you can have um, the ages separated out, so preschool-age children, older children, you know, teenagers, tweens, and then the adults kind of together. 
Um, that way, you know, students will be taught the way they need to be taught. Uh, 17 is like a cooperation oriented, um, so you don't have Little League syndrome. And um, it's not that competition is bad per se, it's just that students get that everywhere. And especially in American society, everything is a competition. So, you know, a child can go to any sport, any activity at any age and be put into this competitive grind. And um, they need an alternative to that. And in a martial arts school, each child should be able to advance at his or her own rate and to be able to achieve things without um, having to fight someone for it and, and lose all the time. And it's not that, you know, it's an everybody wins, uh, everybody gets a ribbon for participation, but it is something that there is something that everyone can achieve. So, for example, you know, everybody in a graduating class can graduate out of high school or get their bachelor's degree. It's not as if there's one degree and you have to beat everybody to it. So there's a different focus on that. In the martial arts school, the students are helping each other excel. They're helping each other know about their bodies. They're helping each other understand how to interact with other people. And they're learning how to bring the best about themselves. So when they do go compete, they have the physical ability to compete, but they also have the mental and psychological skills to deal with winning and losing and to understand their own emotional state. So having an alternative to that is really important. And I say that because I had Little League Syndrome. I did Little League the whole time I did martial arts, and I saw that intense competition. And what got me through it was my martial arts training. So if you're looking for an alternative to that, but at the same time something that can cross-train your child and get them ready so when they do compete, that they're ready for the rigors of competition and the stress of it, then you know that's something that you want out of a martial arts school. Number 18 is, is there a well-structured curriculum? with clear expectations and rewards. And, um, you know, there are martial arts schools and, and I've seen them, which is they, you don't know when you're supposed to test. You don't really know what it is that's on your test. And then the instructors tell you when it's time for your test. Or sometimes they don't even have tests. And they just say, you've been in the school long enough, so you're ready for your next belt. And it's really hard to learn something when you don't know what's expected of you and you don't know what you're going to be tested on. And you know, when I was in school, I had teachers who would always teach us, and then they would put on something on the test that we never even talked about. And I always felt cheated because I did my best to study and to learn what the curriculum that they gave me, and then to throw something out of the left field. Um, I just felt that it wasn't fair. So at my school, we have a, a well-structured curriculum, and we make sure that the students know exactly what they're going to be tested on, and we want them to excel at that because those are the things they need to know. And um, if they do, they're going to do really well in the school. So, you know, that's really important that you know what your child needs to learn and you have the help of it. So we have DVDs and, you know, training opportunities and things written out and, um, you know, special classes to help the students with, you know, anything they need help with. So it's, it's important to know what's expected of you. And um, I would think that that would be standard, but it's not. Um, number 19 is, you know, do you offer private study opportunities, which is good to have something above and beyond regular class because sometimes you just need um, a little bit of extra time. You know, for example, in my school, sometimes I'll do that even within a class. So I would have a, an instructor take a student aside, on a, usually on a regular basis, and they will give the person a mini private, uh, even within class time, to make sure that they're caught up. So you want to make sure that you can get access uh, to that training. <clears throat> Number 20 is our instructors full-time professionals. And um, the reason this is important is because, and the reason I gave this to my uh, sister-in-law is because I personally spent a lot of my time being a part-time instructor. Um, I've taught in gymnasiums, churches, basements, garages, gymnasiums, backyards, you know, part-time schools and full-time schools of all sorts. And I can tell you that um, all the times I taught that I wasn't a full-time instructor, I had other things pulling me away from being the best instructor I could be. And some of that was mental, some of it was physical. Um, when I had shared space with other people, I always had other people coming into our classes and we wouldn't have... Um, you know, we'd have conflicts and so I have to cancel classes and it just wasn't an ideal situation. So when an instructor is a, is a professional and that's what they do, um, that's what you want to look for because they have all of their mental faculties and the day to devote to being the best teachers they can be. So, you know, that's really important to have um, a full-time instructors. 
And um, 21 is just a fun one. Do you offer special events, other workshops, and other uh, training opportunities? There's a world of study in martial arts, and there are so many different things that you can focus on. And um, again, if you have a full-time school, if you have a full-time instructor, then they usually will have um, different um, events, sometimes tournaments, different workshops and seminars, um, like I do bullying workshops, and I do all these other self-defense workshops for the, the community. So um, you want to make sure that you can expand um, your training opportunities. If you really get into doing martial arts, you want to be able to make sure you can get as, as much training as possible. Uh, 22 is uh, about goal setting and time management skills because, um, you know, the belt system is really a wonderful, it's like unsurpassed, and people take it and use it in other um, venues. I've seen people in music classes using belt systems and, and all these different people because it works really well because you know exactly what you're going to learn and you know how to devote your time and energy to achieve those goals. So you want to make sure that the instructors can, can show you at least some method of setting and achieving goals and developing you know good plans of action for that on a daily basis. 23 is do you offer community building events? Um, this is important because you know, you have children who come into martial arts school and they want to be part of something. They want to be part of a positive community and they want to make friends. So there's a social aspect of martial arts that uh, I have found over the years, which is really powerful, um, especially for just training. Um, when kids have friends, they want to go uh, to come to class even if they're not as motivated. So there's more of that binding them to doing positive activities. Um, you know, we do um, board breakathons and um, fundraisers and different things that we do at our school and you know we have movie nights and all these different things that the kids can do because you know they really like to see other kids their age and um, it's a really positive um, part of a school if, if they have that 24 is the offer leadership training and a lot of um, students do come from that after a while we have in our school um, we have students who excel in school and we help them excel in school and they want to continue to actually be leaders and small group leaders and do different things within their academic school or on their sporting team. And so we will teach them how to deal and lead small groups, one-on-one, -on -one, bigger groups, and we have a, an entire curriculum for that. So, you know, that's an element of martial arts that uh, martial arts should be leaders. And um, so that's something to look for. 25 kind of goes back to um, what we had earlier, which is you teach them how to deal with bullies without violence and physically if you need to do it. And um, like I said, in my school, you know, I've written books about it and we do that constantly um, of how to deal with the situation. So we put them in the scenarios so they can practice. They can practice verbally. They can practice um, physically. And so the physical martial arts will work in um, kind of in a humane way so they don't hurt the person permanently. So they can just stop bullies and I have if you read my book, I've got tons of stories of my kids who've done that. They've just either physically stopped the bully in, in a way that they didn't hurt him or they uh, verbally de-escalated situations. So, you know, that's really important. Otherwise, you get kids who just want to go out and fight. And uh, our focus is self-defense and not fighting. And if you have a school that's just promoting fighting, 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 you know, you're going to get what I call muscle without morals. You know, they have all the physical ability. And if they don't have the um, psychological maturity, then they're going to hurt people. So you know, it's really important that you have a school that uh, really fosters that. And um, you know, some people do. They just get they get all the physical ability, and they don't get the maturity to to, to handle it. And um, you don't want that for your child. So that's uh, teaching and uh, the curriculum. So the last few questions are all about the facility that you're going to train in. So. Uh, question 26 is, can parents watch class? And it seems a little odd, but there are places that refuse to allow parents to watch. And again, as a self-defense instructor, just on the safety part, I always want to be able to watch my children. Uh, even if it's from the other side of a glass or from an, some type of sitting area, um, I need to be able to see what people are telling my child, how they're interacting with my child, how they're touching my child. So that is really important, not just for learning, but also for safety's sake. If somebody is telling you that you can't see what they're going to do with your child for an hour, um, I would never let my kids do that. So make sure that somewhere you can watch um, a class. You don't have to be in a class um, actually on the mat. If you can just see it. So um, some places, that the schools are small so that they don't have a place. I know my first school in Longmont years ago, was so small that I just had a very small sitting area and I really needed the parents to be quiet, which is one of the reasons people don't 
um, want children or parents to watch because they don't want them to interfere with class. Um, but that's no reason to not be able to watch it all. You can sit quietly and not interfere with the class. Uh, 27 is, um, does your equipment meet uh, safety regulations? And this is another important one for safety's sake because if the gear is old um, and just used and everybody's using everyone else's gear, um, that's just something that could uh, lead to injury. So you just want to make sure that, you know, they have enough gear and that um, you can use it. Uh, you can use it safely. 28 is, is your training area matted? Um, this is kind of a bone of contention with martial arts schools because um, adults like hardwood floors. Or some people train on, on uh, carpet that's over concrete. Uh, some people train on really hard surfaces. And it's good for adults, and that's a whole other issue. And um, But for children and for most people, you want to have some type of matted floor because while it's true that a hard floor will help you learn quicker as far as rolling and falling safely. Um, children are going to run and jump and fall a lot. And while they're learning, they need to have some type of uh, injury, injury prevention. So it's, uh, you know, best and it's, you know, an industry martial arts standard of well matted floors uh, in training. 29 is um, our younger family members allowed to wait in the school. So um, this is an important uh, question asked just for uh, logistics sake. Uh, many of our families have multiple student, multiple children. Some of them are multiple students. Some of them, you know, go over to the gymnastic school and come back. And um, it helps a lot for parents if you can wait and work in class. Like we have places in Wi-Fi that parents can work and not just get disrupted or disrupt class. It's the same with uh, other family members. Can the other family members you know, have time. Sometimes it's just a half hour that they need uh, before they can get to something else, uh, you know, another activity or tutoring or something. So that's just a, a logistic consideration that um, it, it helps out a lot. If there's a place where you can eat in the school, um, you can sit and watch class, do homework, some stuff like that. So that's a good question to ask. Um, and the last one kind of sums everything up is, you know, is the school dedicated to martial arts training and character development? Um, or, or you're sharing it. If, you, if you're taking your child to a place that is sharing a space with a gym, a rec center, a dance studio, um, other activities, it's going to lose its focus. So um, if you really want the benefits of martial arts school, um, everything that you know we as martial artists are known for, um, you really want a place that is dedicated specifically, exclusively to teaching that, because that's the type of place that's going to do it best. So I hope. Um, Going through these 30 essential questions will help you pick a school. Uh, if you have any questions, you can email me, brad at scornavaco.com. You can call us at 303-485-5425, and we'd be happy to help you out. And uh, if you happen to be one of those people who is looking at this and you're in the area, you know, we'd love to see you. Come in and try a free class. Uh, we're at 1830 Boston Avenue, Suite F. Um, and like I said, you can just call me. You can call Ms. Michelle. Um, you can visit our website at www.scornavaco.com. If you start spelling it, Google will fix it for you. So you don't have to worry about spelling my last name. Um, but I will spell it for you, S-C-O-R-N-A-V-A-C-C-O. -C -C and um, I hope this helps. Thanks a lot.